All right, folks. Uh, so our, our next presentation is going to be by Jan Spelucci and someone that doesn't really uh, need much of an introduction. And she's going to be uh, focusing on uh, her topic is going to be presence restrictions. And uh, I know personally over the years what I found was, you know, we had this evolution where we learned that presence restrictions, you know, simply don't work. Uh, lots of research came out. Not, not only that, but a lot of people got sued. And uh, I think somebody in this room uh, had something to do with some of that. Anyways, uh, and, and we point out to lawmakers, say, hey, you know, resident restrictions, you know, saying where somebody can sleep at night just doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, lo and behold, lawmakers went, wow, you're right. We'll dream up something else. We'll call it presence restrictions. So that's what she's going to talk about. And I think Brenda wants to make a few other announcements before she gets started. Yep. And the other thing is we do actually have somebody to properly introduce Janice this morning. So, so, uh, we got somebody doing that, so I'll hand the mic over to you next. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to repeat, a lot of you folks weren't here first thing this morning. Janice, I assured Janice she can have her full amount of time, so if we're running a teensy bit over, I'm sure you won't mind letting her run a few minutes over, and she won't mind either. <laughs> um, but I, I just, again, if, if people are still wanting to combine rides or, or need a ride, um, if you're not already scheduled you know go out uh, at, at noon out to the registration desk and we'll see if we can combine rides out to DFW uh, again the the live stream is being recorded we'll be sending you a code sometime afterwards via email so you can go back and access those that things it'll be it'll be free for everybody that's already paid for the conference for at least about a month after that uh, we may be shifting over to pay-per-view I'm not sure of the details on that um, and again if you have comments criticisms suggestions ideas uh, about the conference feel free to jot those down on one of your little sheets of paper drop those off up at the registration desk and we will also send around an official uh, evaluation form I promised you Chrysanthi Leone's uh, email address those of you who might have participated in that last year she says she has her results done and if you would like to have those her email is Santhi, that's S A N T H I, at UDEL, U D E L, dot EDU. So if you're interested in the results of her study, she'd be glad to send those to you, or, and then any feedback that you have on that study. And if you didn't catch all that, come and talk to me afterwards. Um, so you get an extra five minutes. Okay. So good morning. Everybody, and Chance thank gonna, you. Chance is going to officially introduce you. I handed it over to him. Oh, okay. Uh, for everybody who doesn't, I was for everybody who doesn't know, uh, uh, this is Janice Bellucci. She is the president of California RSOL, and she spoke briefly about presence restrictions yesterday, and uh, she's going to go more in depth today. And with that, I give you Janice. Thank you, Chance. Okay, so thank you. Thank you all for for being so tenacious and sticking with the conference. Um, we are the last presentation uh, of the conference and I consider that to be an honor. And, um, and I wanna tell you that we're gonna break it up into two parts. So we are gonna talk about residency re presence restrictions, correction, and then um, I have a special personal presentation called I Have a Dream. So if anybody has ever heard Martin Luther King's speech of I Have a Dream, I modified it approximately two years ago, and um, I am a follower of Dr. King and the work that he did. By the way, when we had our protest in the city of Carson, it was on the 50th anniversary of Dr. Martin Luther King's um, march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, and that made it an extra, extra special day for us. So having said that, I have asked my esteemed colleague, uh, Chance Oberstein, who is a uh, criminal defense attorney, excellent, and also he is the vice president of our organization. So I'm gonna sit down for just a couple of slides and then I'll engage. All right, thank you, thank Chance. You. Thank you, so yeah, we do have our first slide up. Um, again, this is about presence restrictions, and, and just by way of introduction, uh, we'll talk about what they are. And as you can see on the slide, uh, they limit where registered citizens may be present, and this includes public places such as parks and beaches, libraries and museums, schools and daycare centers, um, and private places like movie theaters, bowling alleys, and fast food restaurants. And if you put all those things together, there's not much more 
you can limit. So it looks like just about everything that you would wear, everything where a person would normally want to go at almost any time is off limit to registered citizens. Yes, sir. It's the private sector, and, and, and we'll get into that, I think, in a little bit. Uh, this, it, it's, it's what we call a state preemption issue. Uh, the state is really <clears throat> regulating that area, but cities have been doing the same. They've been encouraged to do the same. And so you have the state scheme, which is the general scheme, and then you have local municipalities, like cities, doing their own ordinances. And that's where it gets complex, and that's where it gets really nasty. Okay, the next slide. Okay, it's been adopted widely. And, and in Orange County, and I think Janice went over this yesterday, uh, a judge who became the district attorney of Orange County, uh, uh, his name is Rakakis, has been pushing these things uh, all over Orange County. And other municip uh, municipalities, other cities have been adopting the same. But if you look up here, you've got 79 cities and 11 counties that are doing these things. I mean, how is, it, how, how, how is, a, how is a person who's, who's registered supposed to know where they can do, do or where they can go and what they can do in any particular city? It's, it's just ridiculous. And if you look, um, you know, that's really kind of inconsistent with state law. State law says parolees with victims 13 and under are regulated. Uh, permission is required before entering public parks. That's a requirement. You have to go to the sheriffs or police, uh, whoever regulates the jurisdiction and ask for permission, but it's not totally off limits. And Jessica's law, as a rule, is used as the authority for all these limitations on the state level. And now I'll let Janice get into the local ordinances and uh, the complexity of this issue. Thank you, Tina. You're welcome. So folks, <clears throat> I told you I'm not a patient person, right? <laughs> And the fact is that um, I did create uh, two organizations. So in 2011, I created the California Reform Sex Offender Laws. And what I mean by that is I got us incorporated. I got nonprofit status through the Internal Revenue Service and California Franchise Tax Board. And quite frankly, I highly recommend you do the same. Okay, so we had to get some structure together. And then we created a foundation because we had some I just call them rich people. Um, I guess some people call them high net worth individuals who wanted to make contributions, but they wanted them to be a tax deduction. So it's not that hard to do. So it's a 501c3 under the Internal Revenue Code. All right? We have two separate boards of directors. You can have some overlap, but I recommend against it because one of the things that can happen is somebody later could come challenge your 501c3, your charity. Why would they want to do that? Because you're doing something they don't like, okay? So, so far, so good. But anyway, we realized that we had two organizations and we had board members who'd never met each other. So I knew everybody and they knew me, but we had people who'd never even met each other. We decided we had to have a face-to-face -face meeting. And California's a big place. I mean, it takes like, I don't know, 12 hours to drive from one end of the state to the other. That's in one direction, right? And so I was like, okay, where can we meet that's convenient, centrally located, blah, blah, blah. We just chose Los Angeles. The northern people had to fly into LA, but we, play, we chose a place right near there. And during that face-to-face -face meeting, some wonderful things happened. Bonding. Wow, I'm a human, you're a human. I'm a registered citizen, you're a parent of a registered citizen, I'm not even the one, but I care a lot about this cause. And then the idea started uh, happening. So, are we on that chart? We are. Okay, so what we decided was, we were just mad as hell and tired of reacting to what people were doing to us. And so we decided that the best defense was a good offense, right? So we started suing the bastards. And, uh, you know, there's different ways to get people's attention. And before we sued them, quite frankly, we went to their city council meetings. And I can't tell you how many times I went to a city council meeting. And again, I drove four hours in one direction, spoke three minutes, and drove four hours in the other direction through rush hour traffic. It is not pleasant. 
but it's worth it because you have voiced your opinion. And by the way, we would just put out an alert, doing it electronically, or I've got a city council meeting, this is what the bastards are about to do, come and testify. And oh, by the way, don't expect a positive result. Okay, so we would go to these city council meetings and we would rant and rave about the Constitution. I out there waving my little pocket Constitution, we're wearing patriotic looking buttons and everything, and they still voted the wrong way. But, and often then that led to having a drink at a bar later um, to uh, go over the events of the, of the evening. But the fact is, you know, you, you can only do that for so long. So we gave them, as far as I'm concerned, is this next? Um, we gave them every opportunity to do the right thing. And I believe in being fair, and I actually don't like to file lawsuits. It's not what I prefer to do. I'm a persuader. I want to sit down with somebody. I want to show them the facts and let them figure out for themselves that this is the right thing to do. But unfortunately, not too many people are that smart, I guess. Um, so they don't do it. Okay, so what we decided to do was we decided to file lawsuits. So next. Um, then the question is, if you're going to file a lawsuit, do you file it in state court or do you file it in federal court? And let me tell you what I think the magic formula is. A straight court judge in California faces re-election. A federal court judge is appointed for life. Hmm, in general, where would I rather go? I'd rather go before a judge who's appointed for life and who can make an unpopular decision. So most of the time, I go to federal court. And every once in a while, I go to state court, because I will tell you the federal judges in Orange County are the stupidest judges, or maybe they're the most corrupt judges. I don't know what their problem is, but I'm not going in front of them again. So I will go to a state court in Orange County, though I prefer not to deal with Orange County, quite frankly. Okay, and they're the cesspool that they are, and I, we can't even meet in Orange County, by the way. We scheduled one meeting. We have monthly meetings all over the state. We had one meeting scheduled in Orange County. We were to meet at a church, and three days before our event, they canceled it. Actually, I thought four days before the event. We had sent out 500 letters to people living in Orange County. We didn't have their phone numbers, and their email addresses are not on our Megan's Law website. And when I talked to a mailing professional about what's the best way to get a hold of these people and let them know that this meeting has been canceled, this, they said send a postcard. I'm like, right, I'm going to send a postcard telling them not to come to a sex offender meeting <laughs> hmm, that the postman and everybody else is going to read. So I came up with what I consider some clever wording. Remember that meeting you got invited to on this date, at this time, in this place? Don't go there. It's been canceled. That's what I said. And I also decided that I had to be there to catch anybody who might show up because I didn't know if the media would be there. And so I drove four hours in one direction for a meeting that was canceled. And I'll never talk to that church again, but I understand why they did what they did. Because they got, they got pressure from the public, not that you know don't have a meeting by the way this church provides housing to registered citizens that's a great irony of this and yet they were afraid to have a meeting of registered citizens and family members okay so back to the best court also i think in every state there's some some places where are more liberal and some places that are less liberal or more conservative. And so I know in, as I mentioned, Orange County, it's a very conservative place. We don't have to mention any political parties, it's just a conservative place. And then we have San Francisco, which is a very liberal place, right? And so when ACLU in, uh, decided to file a lawsuit to uh, try to stop the implementation of a ballot proposition, and we're a plaintiff in that case, we went to San Francisco. It's the most liberal place in our state, especially when it comes to judges. And there's one particular judge there who actually was a colleague of Martin Luther King, and I think that they appointed him to the bench to shut him up, and he's still there. And so we got him as a judge. <laughs> it was wonderful. 
Okay, the next thing to do is to draft what I call a model lawsuit, okay? And so this model lawsuit, you have something called causes of action. And the fact is when you take on something like presence restrictions, it's the same causes of action. All you have to do is change the references to the stinking code that, you want to, that you're challenging. Okay, so it's, once you get that model done, it's a lot easier. I have a federal model. Anybody who wants to use it, contact me, okay? And you can use it in your federal jurisdiction as well. Now, I also have in there an argument on these presence restrictions cases. That's a state cause of action. And it's preemption by our uh, state law, and that's something from our state constitution. I regret putting it in there because every case <laughs> got decided that did get reached decision because most of them settled like in usual law. Most cases settle, you don't go to court. So what happened was the judges said, oh, this is much easier. Yes, it's preempted by state law. And by the way, after we started the lawsuits, we had a state appellate court agree with us on state preemption. So it was so much easier to cite that one case and say you're out, okay? We had, um, I think there's a prior slide that said 79 cities that had ordinances. We had a bunch of counties, about 12 counties too, that had ordinances. Oh, by the way, they were not the same ordinance. They were not the same ordinance. So if you are on the registry and you want to be a law-abiding citizen, you didn't know. If you could go to the beach, you could, didn't know if you could go to the park, you didn't know if you could go to the library or the swimming pool. You didn't know. And I'll tell you why, because the bastards didn't put any signs up. So you're supposed to know when you're driving from LA to San Francisco and you stop in some little town off the freeway to go get gas. Oh, and now they've got a fast food restaurant and it has a playground. You're supposed to know you can't be there. Give me a break because they didn't post any signs. Why did they not post any signs? It costs too much money. I mean, think of it. If they had to put a sign at every entrance to the park and all these other places they say that you can't go, it would cost a lot of money. And that's why they didn't do it. So we actually had a state legislator who introduced a bill that would have required them to put signs up. But we decided it was better to get rid of them. So we did. Okay, next. Uh, challenges and lawsuits. Plaintiffs have to have standing. And I think Richard mentioned it very briefly, and I know he's working on a case here in Texas, and that was an issue. So just because a law is unjust doesn't mean you can challenge it, unfortunately. Now, Justice William O. Douglas, a former justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, who's one of my heroes, um, he uh, himself argued that trees have standing. Okay, you can't cut it down a tree, and a tree would have standing to, in fact, uh, challenge somebody that wants to cut it down. Well, that's not the rules today, but anyway, thank you, Justice Douglas, for trying. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, the thing is, when you look at the ordinance that you're trying to overturn, ask, does the statute apply to all registered citizens? And most of them did. Anybody on the whole freaking registry. Though when you look at the findings of the law that's being passed, it says, we want to protect children. Really? Well, what if this man raped an adult woman? All right? He's never harmed a child, but we're going to protect children from this man who raped an adult woman. Oh, by the way, 35 years ago. Okay? Second, do you have a registered citizen who lives in that city or county? So if you're challenging your city or county ordinance, it really helps to have somebody who already lives there. It's not absolutely necessary, and I have used the plaintiff, same plaintiff in a lot of my lawsuits, and I didn't get challenged on standing until I sued Los Angeles County. And then I found out I wasn't supposed to do that. But because the other ones I sued after that didn't know about the LA County case, I didn't bother to tell them, and they... <laughs> They didn't challenge standing, so off we went. Okay, we also have a statute of limitations, and this has to do with anything. So if something happens and you want to sue somebody, there's always a statute of limitations. And it's different state by state, so don't ask me what it is in your state. I don't know unless you come from California, and then maybe I know because there's a long laundry list. But what I found out with a statute of limitations in California, it's only two years. 
after the law was passed. Two years. We've only been in existence for four years. Some of these ordinances were passed in 2009. And even, I think 2007 was the earliest one. Again, I didn't know that. Guess what? The city attorneys didn't know that either. So we settled the case. They got rid of their ordinance. They paid us a few bucks on attorney's fees until I got to LA County. Okay, so, <laughs> and then I uh, talk about a facial challenge or you, an as applied challenge. So actually the statute of limitation, the, the facial challenge in, Cal in California is two years. And as applied, it's continuous, okay? They continuously are harming you because you in fact are on the registry and they're telling you can't go to these places. Oh, by the way, if you are lucky enough to have a job and you're paying taxes, you're paying taxes for that park that they're telling you that you can't go to. That pisses me off. Okay, all right, let's go to the benefits of lawsuits. <clears throat> it overturns local laws, okay? It allows registered citizens and their families to go to public and private places. Now, the city of Lancaster was a special beast, and I mentioned it yesterday, but it bears repeating, and that is the city of Lancaster, which as far as I'm concerned is not a place I ever want to visit, but the fact is it's out in the middle of the desert and there are people who live there. If not for another reason, the cost of living is low, right? Other than the air conditioning bill, because it's so hot. So the fact is that, um, Lancaster passed an ordinance that said you couldn't go to the park and you couldn't go to the museum and you couldn't go to the library and you couldn't go to the public swimming pool and you couldn't go to all these other public places or within 300 feet of these places. So actually all of downtown Lancaster was off limits. You couldn't go shopping there. You couldn't go to the restaurants there. The only restaurants that were the nicer restaurants in Lancaster that weren't chain restaurants were in downtown Lancaster. You couldn't go to any of those places. But that wasn't good enough for Lancaster, so they kept going. And you couldn't go to the bowling alley, and you couldn't go to the movie theater, and you couldn't go, I mean, just on and on arcades, any place that had, I think, more than three video games. My local grocery store has three video games. So you can't go to the grocery store, you can't go to Walmart, wherever it was. I mean, this is the kind of crap these cities thought they could get away with. And they were getting away with it until we sued them. And we did write them a letter, and we did go to their city council meeting. I went to that city council meeting with two hours notice. I got a call from a citizen of Lancaster saying, I thought you might want to know what they're about to do tonight. And I was, holy shit. So in two hours, I cranked out a letter, sent it to the mayor electronically, jumped in my car, and Frank, my wingman, drove me to Lancaster. Not that I'm not able to drive, but he likes to drive my car. So anyway, <laughs> off we went to Lancaster, and we testified. It was just the two of us the first time. We came back the second time because we had some advance notice, and we had as many people there as possible, which I think was 10. And most of them, but not all of them, were allowed to speak because then they pulled this little stupid rule. Well, you have to be here before the city council meeting to put in a piece of paper that says you want to speak during general the public comment section, which that's... And I don't know, city councils are different. You need to check this out ahead of time. Sometimes you need to be there ahead of time. I talk about going there and speaking for three minutes, but I sit there for three hours. And you got the Girl Scouts, and you got the Boy Scouts, and you got the, one time they, they actually put out a dance floor, and these people who'd won an international clogging competition got up and did clogging. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's what makes your city special. So, um, you know, the stuff that we sit through uh, is what we sit through. If we're lucky, <laughs> we're high enough on the agenda, we don't have to sit through too much, but sometimes they want to punish you, and they put you at the end of the agenda. So you're there for five freaking hours, and anyway, uh, I think they're just waiting for you to go home, but I'm a tenacious person, and fortunately, I would say all the California RSOL people are tenacious as well. So, um, so we sit there, and by the way, when you speak, it is timed. I don't know any place that's not timed. And they've got buzzers, and they've got hooks, and they shoot you with dart guns. Shoot you with dart guns, not really. But, uh, but the fact is, they, they limit what you say. So you really have to figure out what you're going to say ahead of time, and you have to practice it if you can, even if it's in the car while you're driving there, <laughs> or somebody else is driving you, and you can practice on each other. It helps to know that, because it's amazing how quickly three minutes passes. 
And I don't know that three minutes is the only role, but that seems to be the most common role, is three minutes, at least in California. Okay, um, so when we had all these ordinances, uh, before we did anything, by the way, guess what filing a lawsuit requires, other than time, is money, even if you're willing to do it practically for nothing. And um, so I really screwed up my courage when I went to this one family whose son is in federal prison. Uh, for possession of child pornography. Okay, that's what he did. That's his heinous crime. Um, he downloaded two videos of teenagers doing stuff, right? I guess he thought it was going to be interesting. And I hope it was interesting because he's paying five years of his life in federal prison for downloading those two movies. Because, by the way, if they do it, download video like that. Um, usually it's through, I know LimeWire is one of these sites, and I think there's other ones out there too. Just because you have the capability of distributing, they get you for possession and distribution. And if you're in the federal system, there's mandatory minimums. The mandatory minimum for him was five years. And this is a family that woke up. Remember I mentioned there's this conservative county in California called Orange County? And so Orange County, um, that's where the family lived, and they always thought the police were there to protect them and their family, right? And they found out something different because the cops came like in the middle of the night trying to break down the door because their son um, tried, uh, did download two videos. But the fact is, and now he's in prison, federal prison for five years, and uh, by the way, the family owns a car dealership, and they thought that their son would be able to take off over the car dealership, you know, when dad's ready to retire. He will not be able to get a license. He will not be able to get the necessary license to sell cars. Because he's a registered citizen. In California, you can't cut hair. You can't practice law. You can't practice medicine, you can't repair people's computers, and on and on and on. <clears throat> so, <laughs> well, you can't make a living, uh, many, ex yes. Okay, so we'll get to those laws later. Remember, we picked the lowest hanging fruit, which are these presence restrictions, because even a dummy can figure out that it's unconstitutional not to go to the library, especially when the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals told Albuquerque, you can't do that. That's unconstitutional. Everybody has an access to in, right of access to information. And when you tell a person they can't go to the library, whoever that person is, it's unconstitutional. Oh, by the way, Albuquerque, pay ACLU one point something million dollars in attorney's fees and costs. And they did. So I bring that up all the time. And I hope you will bring it up all the time too because it is a challenge even as a lawyer to try to get other lawyers excited in these cases and want to do something. And I'm sure you've heard attorneys referred to as sharks. You heard that before? <laughs> it's true, okay? And so what I do is I throw as much blood in the water as possible. <laughs> and blood equals attorney's fees, okay? Attorney's fees. So the fact is, when you file these lawsuits under this federal statute, you're not going to get any damages for your client. And how do you quantify, anyway, how much it's worth to you to have a picnic in the park with your family? I'd say it's priceless, like the credit card commercial, right? But the fact is, trying to prove that to a judge? But the fact is, you can get attorney's fees. So please, dangle that in front of your lawyer. You go to a civil rights attorney or a criminal defense attorney and say, look, when you win, because look at California, they won all these cases, when you win, you get attorney's fees. Okay? So, I digress. I went to the family that son is now spending five years in federal prison because he downloaded two videos, and they promised their son that when he got out of prison, the laws would be changed in California. That's the promise they made to him. I did mention they own a car dealership, right? Okay, and the reason we started the foundation was in part because of this family. They said, we want to make a contribution. We have the family trust. We want to give you a donation, but we can't only do that if you're 501c3. No problem. 501c3. One year later, we had a 501c3. By the way, for a long time, or for a while there, a C3 was easier to get than a C4, which is crazy because C3 has these tax advantages the C4 doesn't. 
All right, but remember that whole thing getting caught up in the IRS and the IRS, whoever that was, she lost her job because they were holding them up because I guess it had something to do with Tea Party politics, but they, it held up everybody else. So actually the national RSOL's tax exempt status got held up by that. Okay, so national RSOL now does have a nonprofit status. Okay, it's not a charity though because it or it lobbies. Okay, so that's a big difference. C4, you can lobby. C3, you can't lobby. C4, not a tax deduction. C3, it's a tax deduction. But the fact is, is C3, you can support litigation. And that's what happened. So I went to the family and I said, ah, you said you, you wanted, you promised your son laws would change. Here's a wonderful opportunity. We want to file seven lawsuits. I mean, I scrubbed this number down to its bare skeleton, no meat on the bones. $3,000 a lawsuit. What we're trying to do is raise $21,000. And going in, I thought, you know, if we're really lucky, maybe they'll donate half of the money. And by the way, it's the wife's family trust. And uh, it's the dad <laughs> who's actually more active with us than the wife. And she's kind of got this cigar store Indian face or poker face, you know, you don't know what she's thinking type of thing. It's like, and the median's over and it's like, oh, well, thank you very much for sharing that information and uh, we'll get back to you. I'm like, okay, what up? Did my best. Walking out to, the, to my car and, uh, and he comes running out. He's like a little schoolboy. He goes, Janice, Janice. Yes, Bruce, $25,000. And we use that $25,000 like sourdough starter, okay? We filed a group of lawsuits and then we waited. And when we got the settlement money from those lawsuits, we used it to sue more cities, okay? That's exactly what we did. And it worked beautifully. You have to be patient. Some of the cities were more eager <laughs> to settle and quicker to settle than others and yes we still have a case that's not settled and it was the third there was a third city that we sued so all I know is that settlement check keeps getting bigger and bigger because I'm an attorney I have to work on this case more and more hours applied against it and by the way the settlement fees don't go to me but it can work out that way they're plowed back into the organization Okay, so that the organization has the money to keep going. It's a beautiful formula. It may not work in every place, but I want to tell you, it does work in some places. And there are people out there, there are family members who have money. We have wealthy registered citizens in every state, but they may not tell you about themselves, right? But they'll find you. You have to have some credibility. Okay, another example I had, I talked on the phone, this is after we'd done about 10 of our lawsuits, I just got a call on the phone one day, I frankly never know who's going to be on the other end of the line. I may have some registered citizen who's near suicide, and I do my best, but I'm a lawyer, I'm not a suicide counselor, I do my best, okay, and I have the suicide hotline number, and <laughs> beg, please call this number after you talk to me, and um, but so I never know or it's the New York Times okay or Fox News I just never know so anyway I get a call one day and I'm the father of a registered citizen I'm a contractor I have a contract construction business I want my son to take over my business when I retire he can't get a license as a contractor and so I sat and I listened and I empathized with him it was a 15 minute phone conversation and I mostly told him I'm sorry and I can't help you. And then about 30 minutes later, I get an email. Hi, I'm so-and-so's wife. We want to send you $10,000. What is your federal employer identification number? A 15-minute phone call. You just never know. And I did go meet with a family first, because I thought if I was going to give somebody $10,000, I'd want to know who the heck I'm talking to, even though they can find me on YouTube and otherwise. But the fact is that you never, never know. Some people who are the wealthiest people wear the raggediest clothes. I don't understand it, but what the heck, that's for them. Okay? Um, I also recommend in these lawsuits, if you can, give a small gift to your plaintiff. Okay? 
remember, they can't get damages under the lawsuit, but give them a gift. It takes a lot of courage to stick your neck out there. And I have a plaintiff in California, Frank Lindsay, who's done it over 20 times. Okay, and he's a brave man. Now, he also wrote a book about his experience of being on the registry, but he's also been, you know, a, a attacked by a vigilante, somebody who broke into his house and tried to kill him. And his daughter keeps wishing he wouldn't be a plaintiff in another lawsuit. But the fact is, including the one I filed last week, which had to do with residency restrictions, not presence restrictions, in his hometown. But, and by the way, there are protections. So you can, under certain circumstances, file as a John Doe, okay? If your plaintiff doesn't want to have his or, his or her name known, you can file as John or Jane Doe or Jake Doe, or you can get clever, but they're usually does. And there is a lot of protection, but there's not 100% guarantee. So I always tell my clients there's not 100% guarantee even when the judge issues a protective order. And I have a case right now where one of the defendants in the case has revealed the identity of one of my plaintiffs, one of my John Doe's. And I've got a judge who will not sanction him. And I'm so pissed. But anyway, usually it works. Okay, <laughs> next. Success. Okay, so here we go. Um, now in California, we have virtually no presence restrictions because we sued about 30 cities in 18 months. 30 cities, 18 months. The smart cities, can remember there were 79 to start with, the smart ones saw, uh-oh, so-and-so next to me is getting sued. So when we sued Lancaster, the city next to it, Palmdale, they called me because they had an ordinance just like Lancaster's, and they called me and they said, hey, we know that you sued those other guys. We don't want you to sue us. What will it take for you not to sue us? And I said, it's easy. Just repeal your fucking ordinance, okay? <laughs> it's really easy. And if we don't file a lawsuit, you don't have to pay me attorney's fees. By the way, I had already drafted that lawsuit. <laughs> And I went and met with the city attorney, and I showed him. Here it is. Got your name on it. Okay, you've got uh, 30 days. Repeal in 30 days, which they're going, oh, my God, we can't do that. I go, well, then I have to file a lawsuit. And they found out how to do that. Okay? <laughs> they come in with all kinds of excuses. It's just so precious. If they were a kid, you just pinch their cheeks. <laughs> or whack them over the head like whack-a-mole. Okay, so... Um, yeah, so the uh, city of Carson is, in fact, the outlier. That's what I call them. If you read Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outlier, um, they're the outlier because they said they don't care what the court said. They've said this at a public city council meeting, which is videotaped, and we have it. Okay, so when I find, and they signed a settlement agreement with us. They really did. I have it in writing. July 25th of last year, their city attorney and their city manager signed the settlement agreement. We're going to change our law to basically reflect, reflect state law. We're going to pay you a whopping $3,000 in attorney's fees, right? That's what they said in writing. They wrote the agreement. The agreement says the city manager and the city attorney have the authority to bind the city. And then the city, the city council had a meeting. And they're like, no, we don't like that. And one city councilwoman, Lula, <coughs> said, and we declare war. She's declared war on us. So um, that's why we called a, pi a picnic in our park in March. That's why we're going back in July to a city council meeting. But... I really want to get this mule's attention. So what we had done under the settlement agreement, we did what we said we would do, which is we dismissed our federal complaint with prejudice. We can't go back to federal court with Frank Lindsay anyway. And what we, what, so we dismissed it, and they didn't do what they said they were going to do. Revise their ordinance and pay us $3,000. That's all they had to do. Seems really simple. But they said no. And Lula said, we declare war. So, uh, and then the day 
and the next day after the city council meeting, I got an interesting phone call from the city attorney. He said, we'll settle the case for $25,000. I go, $25,000. That was tempting. I was like, and what's the rest of the story, Bill? We're not going to change our ordinance. I'm like, wow, that sounds like a bribe. Uh, okay, hush money. And I was like, you know, Bill, I'm going to have to discuss this with my client. <laughs> And uh, I'll get back to you. So anyway, um, I did. And uh, of course, my client said, hell no. I want this ordinance gone. That's why we filed the lawsuit in the first place, right? Well, we were willing to pay $3,000 in attorney's fees. He's offering us $25,000. So I said, thanks, but no thanks. Mm. A few hours later, I get an email from the attorney. He sent it from his cell phone. Okay. We attorneys know better than this. He sent me an unprotected email. It said nothing about this is privilege and confidential information. It said nothing that, that has anything to do with anything. He just sent me an email saying the city manager and the city attorney lacked authority to sign that agreement. It's like, I got you, bastard. Because <laughs> I filed a lawsuit for fraud then. Okay? It's now fraud. You're telling me now, after the effect, that you didn't have the authority to bind the city when this agreement that you signed said you did. So you lured us into this agreement, right? You lured us into this agreement, and we did what we promised to do, and your city didn't do it. So you're either lying now or you're lying there. I don't really even care because in California, you can get punitive damages for fraud. Okay, it was already a breach of contract, but now it's fraud. Yeah, I think it's going to have a zero. 25000 at a zero? Whoa! I'm looking forward to this check. And also to provide evidence to our state court judge that the city council is saying they don't care what the courts have ruled. They don't agree with those rulings, so they're not going to abide by them. I think that this might get her attention. And oh, by the way, one of the city council members is an attorney. And I really don't understand that. But that's their problem. Okay, so we do have a state law. And the state law basically says if you're on the registry and you're on parole and your victim is 13 or younger, you can't go to the public park no other place. You can go to the movie theater, you can go to the swimming pool, you can go any other place except the public park until you get your uh, parole officer's permission. That's all. Okay? Some parole officers are humans, some are not. Some will allow, some won't. But that's what the state law says. So we still have that right now in the books, and we haven't decided to sue, uh, challenge that law yet. So, by the way, and... and Part of my thinking, quite frankly, at the time was that for most people, parole at the maximum was five years. Mostly it was three years going in, and then some of them started getting extended to five. We now have 20-year parole. So I was like, you know, this is my, this, this, I, I, trust me, I have a long list of people and organizations to sue, a long list for different reasons, and so it's moved up on my list. And now it has my attention because of the, the parole. So I want to ask, yes, if you have any questions. Um, yes, sir. Was it, besides parole age, was anybody ever prosecuted for a violation? And what was the penalty? Uh, there was no penalty. And as far as I know, nobody was ever prosecuted for violating the law. Okay. I mean, think about it. How the hell do they know where you are unless you're on GPS, right? Well, and, sneak around and follow you. <laughs> OK, they sneak around and follow you if they're really. All sex offenders are on GPS. No, that's not true. No. Okay. Um, those on parole, registered citizens on parole, will have a GPS while they're on parole. Um, while they're on probation, I don't think so. Are there a chance anybody on probation have to wear a GPS? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, they do. Why don't you talk about that? Well, you know, it, it depends. And it, oops. It, it depends on state it, or federal. It, 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 federal is very different. Uh, and. In, in the state, and when we talk about parole or we talk about probation, uh, parole naturally is moving towards GPS because people go to prison for felonies, and so they're considered more serious. Uh, when it comes to probation, 
then it's a risk assessment when it comes down to who's on GPS and who's not. And it's also people who uh, get into the system as potential probation violators who often end up with GPS as an enhancement. Or we have now lie detector tests and when you fail a lie detector test and a psychologist feels that you're being deceptive and you may be a risk, you get hooked up for a time and that's GPS. But you know, in looking at these things, if you want to look at the big picture as far as California goes and you want to really put this thing in context, if you look at all the areas that are off limits, you know, the, the rationale is for public safety, but the underlying rationale is, is that every place where children congregate is a place they want to limit, the latitude. Well, think about that. We're, our state is composed of families, and families have children, and children go everywhere. So there's only two places a registrant, if we allow these things to exist, can go, and that's in their room or out of the state. It's, 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 it's either home alone or banishment. And this is why this work has been so important. And, you know, through probation and through parole, when we talk about GPS, that's one thing. But GPS really doesn't work. Things have happened on GPS that have, and, and judges now are realizing that GPS is not a solution. And cities are doing this out of hysteria. And so the larger context is all this stuff needs to be pushed back and needs to be pushed back quickly. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be in a, a horrible state, a horrible state. We're, we're, we're moving towards uh, something that has never been done before ever, I think, in terms, of, in terms of a subgroup of people in the United States that are supposedly allowed to roam free but can't anymore. All right. Yes, ma'am. Uh, registered people from New Mexico enjoy going over to California, hanging out at the beach, Disneyland. Mm -hmm. What are the dangers of them doing? Well, this is the interesting thing about our presence restrictions laws. It said if you were required to register as a sex offender pursuant to California Penal Code Section 290, they don't have to. So that's one of the points we make in the lawsuit. If in fact you think registered citizens are dangerous, don't you want to include registered citizens from other places as well? But they just said, oh, from California. Only if you're convicted in California. Yes, sir, ma'am. I'd say it's the government's problem, quite frankly. And, and I will tell you, I got a very sad call about a month ago from a dad. He was a brand new father, first time. And uh, his baby was born prematurely, and they weren't sure if the baby would survive. And he wanted to go visit his baby, his son. And the hospital told him no. They told him, you cannot go visit your baby. And I was like, you have got to be fucking kidding me. That father is going to see his son. And I did not stop. I kept calling everybody at the hospital. And oh, by the way, there was going to be a meeting in about a few days where they were going to make a decision about the treatment for the baby. And they were telling him he couldn't be at the meeting. Jeez. And I said, you've got to be fucking kidding me. Why the hospital? Is that a place where children can? Well, the children there. He, here he was in the nursery, right? <laughs> it's crazy, folks. This has nothing to do with reality. Okay? What? Yes, I did. He got to see his son, and he did get to participate in that meeting. He got to basically cast a vote about how his son was going to be treated medically. And that is the limit of stupidity and irrationality and unconstitutionality. And, and I mean, I had people at the hospital apologizing to me. Oh, it's hospital policy, blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, you've never had a situation like this before, have you? And, quite, and the baby has survived, by the way. And uh, so there's all kinds of happy news there. But I will tell you, there are certain things that piss me off, and that was one of them. 
and I wasn't sure what kind of lawsuit I would be filing, but I'd do something. And another example that we had, I'll just mention and then call you two gentlemen back there. Um, we had um, a, a registered citizen from Los Angeles City who decided to go visit a city out in the suburbs. It was a, I remember it was a beautiful Monday afternoon, and he decided to go to South Pasadena to go to the park. I said, it's a beautiful afternoon. I'm going to go to the park in South Pasadena. And uh, uh, by the way, he, he's uh, not listed on our Megan Saul website because he was convicted of a misdemeanor. Okay? And I don't know why somebody in South Pasadena would call the police because somebody's in their park taking pictures, but that's what happened. And the police came and just, you know, they ran him. He's a sex offender, grabbed him, threw him in a squad car, took him down to LA, and booked him. Okay? The city of South Pasadena had sent us a letter signed by the city manager that said we will not enforce our ordinance. Okay? So they, got, they had gotten moved down on the list of priorities to, to be sued because they said we will not enforce our ordinance. I was so fucking mad that day that as soon as I found it, I just stopped everything and I'm at my computer. And we filed a lawsuit the next day. The very next day in federal court, and it's like, listen, bastards, if you're going to play this stupid game with us, then you have moved up to the top of the line <laughs> and you are being sued. And it turned out they had a relatively new city attorney, and, but I had already dealt with her in another case, and she had been fair with me on that case. And she called me up and she said, I'm so sorry. I've been on the job for two weeks. I had no idea. And before it was over, they repealed their ordinance, <laughs> they gave us attorney's fees, and I got a letter from the, I forget if it's a police chief or the sheriff there, that said, we will never do this again, and here is my memo to my troops saying, thou shall not ever do that again. <laughs> so I figured that worked. Okay, but the, the, real, the sad part about this, this is a man who was under the radar, right? He didn't have to, he, his name wasn't disclosed as a sex offender. I don't know what happened to him afterwards. Of course, I'm on the Megan's Law website looking for him so I can contact him somehow, and he's not there. So I don't know who he is, and his name is like John Smith in L.A. I was like, I'm not willing to go through that phone book and send that many letters. But anyway, if he wanted to contact me, contact me, he would. So we didn't file on his behalf, by the way. Frank Lindsay was the plaintiff in that case. Uh, Jason. I, I just had a comment about hospital policy. Okay. Um, my mother is a nurse, and she told me that they have a policy in her, at her hospital that they do not have to admit a registered sex offender. <laughs> wow. They, wait, wait. Yeah. So, that's in, it's in Seattle, a Swedish hospital, but apparently it's a, an organization above that that manages all these hospitals. So it's, it's not just that hospital, it's many hospitals all over the country that they can deny you being admitted to the hospital if you're on the registry. I would like to know about that policy. <laughs> and so, <laughs> <laughs> and if they have any hospitals in California, they'll be hearing from me. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Paul? Do you ever uh, suggest alternative uh, strategies of offering maybe something that the city councils can sub you know, substitute for political cover? Example in Dallas, we had an orange about two or three years ago. Part of it dealt with res, uh, residents living together, but part of it was being near schools, loitering mm -hmm. in the schools. Mm -hmm. Eventually what they passed was a, a sex offender who did not have children at the school could not loiter on the property. Mm -hmm. If they were asked to leave by an authority, they had to leave. If they didn't, they could be arrested. Now, frankly, I don't think, you know, when my daughter's in high school, I don't want some stray adult of any kind who has no business being on the school, or you're not in school. And I spent two hours on the phone with the city, with one of the city council women, and to me it sounded perfectly reasonable. Do you ever take that tact? Yes. And so, um, well, I've mentioned some of these cities that we have sued for presence restrictions. If they will change their law to reflect the state law, that's acceptable to us right now. And Lancaster, I mean, they had a terrible, terrible, terrible law, and they also had Halloween restrictions in there. And we did not contest the Halloween con uh, restrictions. Okay, but I want to tell you, they did not require a sign on the front door. 
So that was actually the very first lawsuit that I filed um, for on behalf of registered citizens. It was because the city of Simi Valley was going to require the registered citizens to put a sign on the front door of the home for 24 hours. And it's like, again, you've got to fucking be kidding me. And um, I, before, I was an, uh, uh, before I became an attorney, I was a newspaper reporter, and I really loved the First Amendment. You know, it's tucked in my pillow every night or something like that. But anyway, the fact is that it really pissed me off, and it's like, we've got to do something. And oh, by the way, I wanted to start out with a very small lawsuit. You know, all we're trying to do is get a sign off the front door. I went to three city council meetings there in Simi Valley because the council's like, we're going to require a sign on the door. No, we're not going to require a sign on the door. Yes, we're going to require a sign on the door. And so when they reached that final conclusion, and oh, by the way, I was practically run over by a registered citizen and the wife of a registered citizen saying, we want to fight. And they meant it. So we fought. And by the way, the judge we had, I was a federal lawsuit, and the judge we had, I read about him, you know, after he's assigned, I read about him online, I'm going, oh my God, this man is crazy. So attorneys hate him. And I was like, oh, we are toast, right? And I'm also requi uh, requesting a temporary restraining order, which is really hard to get. TROs are hard to get. Because, just one to, so, uh, so here we are, and it's getting closer and closer. I mean, sometimes you get an answer on a TRO in 24 hours. It was like 10 days later, and it was like, I don't know, you, if your woman or your wife is overdue with a baby, it's like, when is this kid coming? Um, so I was like, oh, well, I guess we're not going to get the TRO. But that judge was older and wiser, because this is what he did. On the afternoon of the 29th of October, he issued his decision, and he granted our TRO, okay? And they didn't have time to appeal it. Yay, judge. So uh, <laughs> it was worth the wait, for sure. Yes, ma'am? Oh, okay. Uh, yes, sir. With regard to the statute of limitations yes. we discussed earlier, um, can, you, can you play the card of, I, I just got released, and I am subject this law now, even though it was passed four years ago, so it's applied to me now. Do I have three years? Um, you can still do an as applied a challenge, but then the standing is more important in a case like that. Okay, then you actually have standing. So if you live in that city, certainly you would have standing, but if you lived in the city next to it, not. And so Frank Lindsay, who lived in one city, he was suing cities all over right. the state. Any other questions? If not, I have something to share with you. Uh, private presence. What's that? Uh, can corporations restrict can spenders from visiting their facilities? Or private? Uh, theme park, movie theater. So. Uh, Disney World is now, I know. Jeff, do you want to make a comment about that? <laughs> He's doing something on his tablet. Do you want to make a comment about that? Can the private sector um, restrict people from visiting their facilities, like Disney? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know the answer. Yeah. Well, I, could, I could tell you in California, yeah. Disneyland's doing it, uh, and a lot of other private corporations are doing it because they think they can. How do they know? How do they know? Yeah. They, anybody can get on a computer and run the registry. Uh, you can run it. Uh, there's a site. The, the DOJ has a site. And, you can, and, and it's not just limited to California, it covers all 50 states. And so if you buy a ticket at Disneyland, you show your ID, they can run you and they can determine whether or not you're registering. So this has been my suggestion. Buy a ticket somewhere else. And California, you can buy one at the grocery store. But all those registries clearly stay. This is for informational purposes. And restriction of access is not for informational purposes. Okay, so let me tell you about that. <clears throat> I have had filed two lawsuits so far, and both of them have gotten slapped. I have gotten slapped upside the head. Oh no, 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 we have two cases in California, Men Mendoza, no, not Cal it's, I forget if Mendoza is California, uh, Cross versus Cooper is California. Both of those cases say sex offender, tough luck. And so I have gotten two anti-slaps. And by the way, the first of those cases, that's where the judge said in open court, all sex offenders are monsters. They always do it again, and there is no clue. Clear. There's a, we have a clue. Okay, so, oh, 
Let's walk. Like, I, I just had a quick comment, I think, on the theme park thing. Uh, what I had heard is that was generally season passes, that they're running the backgrounds on anybody that applied for a season pass. And uh, and then it would be, you know, rejecting them. So. No, they're, they're, they're going beyond that. And it started with the YMCA, actually. And it's, it's an outgrowth of that. So can you imagine that, Young Men's Christian Association? <laughs> yeah. That believes in redemption, right? Okay, back there. Yes, actually, I can't imagine that. Thank you very much. I've been a member of the Bristol, Virginia YMCA for three years. Something like that. I'm perfectly And the guy, I walked in at one point and said, yeah, I was on a registry. And they said, uh, they sent me a letter and said, uh, we're kicking you out because you're on the registry. You're welcome to come and appeal. So I went up and talked to the guy. And he asked me, can you prove you're not dangerous? <laughs> I said, can you prove you're not? <laughs> you are the one who has the job working with kids. Yeah. But to make very long story very short, they said, no, we're just, they never let me back in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Was and fine. Jean, you have a question or comment? Yes, question. Uh, any thought process about suing places like the Department of Labor, the job seekers who are uh, registered citizens? You know, you no, but uh, if I'd love to learn some more about the facts of the situation because there might be something there. Okay. Might be a little nugget. A reason for Janice to sue them. Okay. <laughs> so um folks, um no more Q&A, please. This, no more residency restrictions. I have a very important message for you, okay? And I want you to know that you are part of a civil rights movement. I hope somebody has explained that to you by now. We, that's what we're talking about. And when California RSOL, our elevator pitch is this. Our organization exists to protect the Constitution by restoring the rights of registered citizens. And I invite you to think of that, to protect the Constitution by restoring the rights of registered citizens. Because any diminution, reduction of protection under the Constitution hurts everybody. Okay, it hurts registered citizens, it hurts their family members, it hurts anybody who cares about them, but it hurts everybody because we have a Constitution that protects us all. And so I want you to remember that while I, ex- while I share with you a dream I have. I'm happy to join you today in a day of consequence, a day that may go down in history as a turning point in a civil rights movement dedicated to restoring justice for all. In 1787, the founders of our country created and adopted a constitution which established United States of America. Four years later, the founders amended the Constitution by adding protections for individuals' rights and liberties, 10 amendments known as the Bill of Rights. But more than 200 years later, the promises of the Constitution and of the Bill of Rights are being denied to a group of citizens and who, lang- who languish in the corners of society and find themselves exiled in their own land. That group of individuals has been labeled by some as sex offenders. I shall henceforth refer to you as registered citizens. Many registered citizens have made a mistake. Many have broken a law. And all have paid their debt to society by going to prison or serving time on probation. Despite the payment of their debts to society, registered citizens continue to be punished by being denied jobs, a home in which to live, credit, access to parks, beaches, and libraries, as well as exiled from some or all members of their families. Some registered citizens are unemployed, some are homeless, and some are murdered by vigilantes for no other reason than they're labeled as a sex offender. This is punishment. 
despite what the U.S. Supreme Court has ruled. The requirement to register is not the same or even similar to becoming a member of Price Club. <laughs> in a sense, we have come to this conference in Dallas to cash a check, a promissory note signed by the founders of our nation. It is obvious today that the United States of America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as registered citizens are concerned. For instead of honoring the sacred obligations of the Constitution, the United States has given registered citizens a bad check, a check which has been returned and marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice in America is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. So we have come to Dallas to cash this check. A check that will give us the riches and security of justice. We have also come to remind the United States of the need to act now. For it would be unconscionable for this nation to overlook the urgency of the moment when civil rights are denied and citizens such as Charles Parker and his wife Gretchen were murdered by vigilantes in South Carolina. This sweltering summer of the registered citizens' legitimate discontent will not pass until there is an invigorating autumn of freedom for registered citizens. 2015 is not the end, but a beginning. Today, there are more than 800,000 American citizens who are being denied their constitutional rights every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. This must stop. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of injustice to the solid rock of justice. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all citizens. But we cannot move forward alone. We must include our loved ones, our parents, our children, our nieces, nephews, aunts, uncles, neighbors, and friends who will serve as an objective witness to the plight of registered citizens. I am mindful that some of you come from faraway states, Maryland, Massachusetts, California. I'm also mindful that some of you have been recently released from prison and some of you are currently on probation or parole. Go back to Maryland, go back to Massachusetts, go back to California, go back to the place where some homeless registered citizens live, knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. I say to you today, friends, even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out for all citizens the true meaning of its creed, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal. I have a dream that one day in the parks of Texas, registered citizens can enjoy a picnic with their family. I have a dream that one day in the libraries of New Mexico, registered citizens can read a book. I have a dream. I have a dream that one day in the state of California, registered citizens will be allowed to enter emergency shelters when an earthquake arrives. I have a dream that one day in the state of Massachusetts, registered citizens will be able to live with all the members of their families. I have a dream. I have a dream that one day in the state of Ohio, registered citizens can celebrate Halloween in their own homes without fear of arrest. I have a dream. I have a dream that one day in the state of Texas, registered citizens can live in any city or county they wish to live in. I have a dream that one day in America, registered citizens will no longer be able or required, rather, to wear GPS monitors. I have a dream that one day in America, armed police officers will no longer show up on the doorsteps of registered citizens. I have a dream.
I have a dream that one day the names, photos, and home addresses of registered citizens will no longer be published on the internet. I have a dream that one day in America, elected officials will no longer pass laws that deny the civil liberties of registered citizens in order to increase their chance of election or re-election. I have a dream. I have a dream that one day registered citizens will not be treated like lepers and will not be publicly disgraced, humiliated, and shamed. I have a dream that one day in America, registered citizens will not be hunted down and murdered by vigilantes. I have a dream. I have a dream that one day in America, the U.S. Supreme Court will recognize that registration is punishment and prevent new laws from being applied to registrants retroactively. I have a dream that one day in America, registered citizens will live in a nation where they will not be judged by a mistake they made often decades ago, but by the content of their current character and actions. This is our hope. This is a faith with which we will continue our work to restore justice for registered citizens. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. That will be the day when we will all be able to sing with new meaning, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. And if America is to remain a great nation, this must be true. So let justice ring from Mount Rainier in Washington. Let justice ring from the Mississippi River in Louisiana. Let justice ring from the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. Let justice ring from the beaches of California. Let justice ring. And when these things happen, justice will ring. From every village and hamlet, from every state and city, and that will turn in turn, speed up the day when all citizens, registered and unregistered, join hands and repeat together the ultimate goal of our movement to live as citizens which is expressed clearly in the last six words of our nation's Pledge of Allegiance, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, folks. Um, that was that was that was amazing, wasn't it? Uh, absolutely amazing. So I think we're going to have uh, some closing remarks uh, by a few different folks here uh, to adjourn for the day, and then we'll uh, <clears throat> let everybody uh, go and get back on the road here. Um, you know, for me, it, the last day is always kind of bittersweet. Um, I kind of kind of feel a little sadness, and that, and that comes from the camaraderie. You come back year after year, you see a lot of same faces. You make some new friends, of course, as well. But it's just amazing how these conferences have become such a almost like an extended family, and it's it's really wonderful to see you all again. Um, you know, each and every year. And obviously we're also here to learn and come up with new tactics and new strategies, whether it be in your own state or regionally or even nationally for addressing these issues. And I hope everybody will take everything, be inspired to go back and take what they've learned and apply it back in their own states. And, um, you know, somebody mentioned this morning that this is really a marathon, not a sprint. And I thought that was a really good, really good comment. And um, the pink elephant in the room here is that gay marriage is now legal in every state in the union. And, and I, know, I realize there's some people who are not going to agree with that in here. But what's more important about that is the fact that how long it took 
and how they were actually able to get there. And Larry Neely, I don't know if he's in the room, but he has said over and over that he just, even the decisions that were coming down before that, he said he couldn't believe it. He said, I thought I was going to be long dead before that ever happened. He says, I believed it would happen, but I thought I was going to be long dead before it happened. And here it is. It, 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 it's here. So, I mean, it just goes to show that, um, you know, these things, uh, you know, do happen. They take time, and, uh, and hopefully it'll take less than, than we're imagining. And I just also encourage everyone, and, and I know I'm kind of fit into this too, go back, figure out how you can get more time, get more money to the movement, because that's what it's going to take. And figure out how you can motivate other people in your state to get both more time and, more, even more importantly, more money, because that's what it's going to take. And uh, so I hope everybody had a great time. And uh, let's see, who's going to give some comments next? I think it's going to be Brenda. And I'm going to keep them real brief. I know everybody's ready to go home at this point, as much fun as we've all had. I just want to thank you all again for coming. I love you guys. I'm not always really good at getting out there and saying thank you to everybody who's, who's been helping and who's come. Uh, but I just want to say it's just been really great this year. We've been really grateful that you've all been here. Uh, a quick piece of, of again, if, if you're trying to get to Love Field, the person who was willing to go down to DFW, everybody's pretty much made their plans and already gone. Uh, we do have somebody that's going to be heading out to Love pretty shortly afterward. Right, so again, just kind of head up to the, up, you know, near the registration desk. Um, are they still in the room or are they outside? In the hall? Okay, they're not here right now. So anyway, so just head up there. Uh, so we do have at least one van that can maybe get some folks out to Love right after uh, the event. Um, but again, I just I do just want to thank everyone. I, I appreciate you all for coming. Please, if you got a few minutes before you leave, write up a little, just a note or two, things that went well, things that didn't go well. Nothing's ever perfect. So we do want to hear the negatives as well as the positives. And, and again, thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next year, wherever we are. Yes? When, when will the decision be made? We're going to try to make it a lot earlier. We make this promise every year. Yeah, Lloyd's over here laughing. Every year for the last four years, we said, we've got to do this earlier next year. Our goal is to try to pick something out. But like I say, the default will be here uh, because we know it works here. we got a system. Obviously, it went pretty smoothly. You know, as soon as we move, uh, going to be much. And we, we'll probably have to jack the price up hugely if we go somewhere else because the church gives us so much. Uh, it's, well, we do give them a donation here at the church, but um, but yeah, it's it's you know they give all this AV equipment comes with the church. If we go we go to a hotel setting, we're paying thousands. You know, it's it's so so that's that's a lot to consider. Um, but so as soon as we can, we'll certainly let you know. We're going to try to have it soon. Yes. That will be well. You know what? Um, hey, Kurt. Can, can we, yeah, it, it is already on YouTube because she did it last year. I don't know if you changed anything two years ago, two years ago in California. But can we separate that out uh, when, when we upload it so that we've kind of got I have a dream tucked a little bit separately? I'm already doing it. Okay, yeah. Huh? The text. Um, ah. Okay, so she has that, yeah, and, and we could, you could also send it to me if you want, Janice, and we'll try to tuck it somewhere on our website as well. Okay, yeah, so again, the, the, all of this will be available on live stream, uh, you know, and I'll send you a code as soon as we've got that available. Any other questions or comments or concerns right now? If not, again, thank you very much. Uh, group hug. <laughs> yeah, thank you.